You're checking in with the doctor for the greatest fantasy baseball podcast in the world. Starring your hosts, Dr. Fantasy. I'm ready to rock and roll today. And Rydog. A Harrison masturbator. Welcome to Doc and Dog, your fantasy baseball geniuses. Presented by the Fantasy Holics. What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Doc and Dog, presented by the Fantasy Holics. My name is Jordan Jica, and I'm here with my co-host Rye Dog. Rye Dog, are you ready to discuss the Cleveland Indians today? I am ready, Doc. Let's show these great fans of Cleveland we got some great content to produce. And today we are in the middle of our baseball mini series, and we are breaking down the lineup, pitching rotation, a few impact prospects, and what it means for your fantasy league so we will jump right into well before i jump right into it this is presented by the fantasy holics make sure you subscribe to us on youtube like our facebook page follow us at fantasy holics one on twitter and check out our website the fantasyholics.com so now with that being said let's hop right into the lineup and we will kick it off batting first for them is francisco lindor playing shortstop for him he is currently going pick eight overall, so right in the middle to back end of that first round. You know, everybody knows he's one of the elite shortstops in the game, great defensive shortstop, steals 25 or so bases every year, showed some 30 home run pop. You know, I've discussed it in previous episodes before. I personally don't take a shortstop early. I think shortstop's extremely deep, and I think the difference between a guy like Lindor and even, oh, we'll say Ahmed Rosario who I think is a good sleeper and was a 2020 guy last season, I think the difference between Lindor and Rosario, almost 150 picks apart, is much less than some of the top outfielders and middle-of-the-pack outfielders. So when you really start to look at the positional differences, I don't take a shortstop early. I definitely can't blame anyone who does take Story or Lindor in that range just because you know you're getting a 25-steal, 30-home run guy, and really he's one of the best players in the league. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, if you're going to take a uh, shortstop early, you got it. Might as well take the best one. Uh, we know Lindor is going to be in our unanimous rankings when we do that in the upcoming weeks. So make sure you guys are looking forward to our rankings. We're going to be producing in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, I mean, as far as fantasy relevance for Lindor, he's a top ten guy. So if you're going to take him, take him. You know, you get shortstop early, I guess. But like you said, shortstop's so deep, you can afford to wait. But I'd rather go outfield with my first uh, first round. Yep, definitely. And I think when you have, and I've done a few drafts now, and I did some mocks earlier in the offseason, I think if you have that pick 6 to 12, I think it is a really hard decision, though. I think there's a lot of different directions you can go in. Uh, you know, I was really high on trying to get Soto whenever I was in that position, but realistically, once you have the top five off the board with Trout, Acuna, Bellinger, uh, Mookie, you know, then you start having to make decisions a little bit. I always have Soto as my fifth guy there, but that's why once you start getting to six and beyond, I think the decision's really challenging. I agree, and I think, you know, the top six are basically all locked up. Like you said, with Yelich, Bellinger, Betts, Trout, Acuna, and then you have you have Soto in there as well. So that top five, top six range is all but a lock. After that, it gets really tough. Because you're not sure if you're going to go outfield or if you just take the best player on the board. So, I mean, even then, if you take Lendora eight, you still have really good shortstops going mid second. Guys like uh, Story and Turner, who I would prefer Trey over, of course. And then you have Tatis as well. So that's four shortstops going, and the two in the top two rounds for sure. So if you miss out on Lendor. Even then, you, you'll still get an elite shortstop if you want it, one of those elite shortstops. So, yeah, no, and I think we mentioned before that Tatis was going too high, but I think I'd rather have Tatis at his ADP than Lindor at eight overall, which might sound a little crazy, but I think they could put up similar offensive numbers if Tatis stays healthy. So, uh, we'll go next in their lineup here. Won't talk about Lindor too much more. Number two in their lineup is Oscar Mercado playing the outfield for him, currently going pick 125. He's personally one of my favorite uh, mid-round outfielders. You know, you're getting a 2020 guy, and I think he could be similar to what Starling Marte is, 
almost 70 to 80 picks later, which is the reason that I love him. He's younger, had a good rookie season, batting at that top of the lineup. You know, we have Santana, Ramirez, and Franmil Reyes behind him. So he's going to score runs, steal some bases. You know, when And there's not too many guys that are 20 steal guys anymore. I think the, uh, last season we had 33 of them. Uh, when I was looking at it. So not too many guys that steal 20 bases. So when you're getting a mid-round pick 125, I like him a lot in that spot. I agree, too. I mean, a pick 125, you're getting a guy, probably your third, possibly fourth outfielder. But he's been very consistent, what I noticed last year, too. He didn't really go in too many slumps at all. So Mercado going at 125, that's really great value. And batting early in this really decent lineup, I would take him at his ADP all day. It's definitely a steal, and I know you're all for your value there, Doc. So value, that, my, that, that is. I need to put something right here. Guess. Value, <laughs> <laughs> right above the, right above on the screen. Value. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I think we're on the same page there. Uh, number three in that lineup is Carlos Santana playing first base. He's going pick one forty three. No, I always struggle with these older guys. You know, I, I tend to draft younger players with upside. I think a lot of them have more to play for. You know, you can always say older guys, and we'll talk about Nelson Cruz in another episode. But, you know, you always want to say, oh, these older guys are going to decline. But nothing in Santana's metrics, nothing that he did last season indicates that he's slowing down. He still rips the ball. He still hits 30 home runs. If you're in a league that counts on base percentage, I definitely – would be targeting him. He's always had a great strike zone discipline. So, you know, at 143, I think it's fair for him. You know, it's not hard to find home runs in today's game anymore, but I think if you're looking for a guy that's – and I see him dropping a lot of drafts, and I think just because he's not a sexy name, he's a guy you're like, yeah, you know, I guess I'll start Carlos Santana at first. But realistically, he'll finish as a top 10 first baseman, and after you have that first group of top-tier guys like Alonzo that are off the board and Bellinger – you really can't argue with taking Santana as your starting first baseman. No, you really can't. I mean, like you said, his numbers have been there. I mean, he's, what is he, like 34, 35 now? Yeah, so he's, right not, now. He, yeah, he's not young. And, I mean, you said, you know, you said yourself, you, you prefer to take the guys that are younger. But, I mean, at one at 140 ADP, I mean, I don't see why anyone wouldn't want to take him. He's very consistent throughout the years. And first base, as we've talked about, is really a shallow position, and it seems like Santana is the guy that just keeps falling in drafts, but realistically will finish at the end of the year in the top 10 for first baseman. So I'm all on board for him. Yeah. And then batting behind him, they have Jose Ramirez in the cleanup spot, bat, or, uh, playing third base for him, currently going right around pick 21, 22, right in that second round, early to mid-second round range. So, you know, he's a guy that I, I can never get on board with him. I don't know why. You know, I know a lot of people are high on Jose Ramirez. He's a 25-25 guy, you know, which is hard to find in today's game. I, I, I don't know. I always feel like he – I think he outperformed what his uh, ceiling is last year. When you look at his advanced metrics, they're all solid. Um, you know, he hits – he doesn't hit the ball overly hard. But I, I just – I don't know. I, I – have a problem taking him that early and I know realistically it's probably good value for a 25 25 guy but for some reason I just can't personally get on board I don't know what your opinion is on Ramirez but I don't know I'm just not uh I'm not a fan of taking him in the second round yeah I don't know what it is about him because I have that same feeling too I'm not sure if it's a space or what but <laughs> I just don't want him I mean I feel like he's one of those guys that has a couple good years but could possibly very well fall off because he wasn't very highly scouted either. Like you said, though, I mean, 25, 25 guys are very, very rare in today's game. But I'd rather take Starling Marte just because he's been consistent for the past six years and you know what you're getting out of him. And he's going around that range, too, probably a couple picks later. Uh, I don't know. And third base is also very deep. I mean, I could rather take Josh Donaldson or Justin Turner or even Matt Chapman. And I'd actually feel more comfortable starting one of those guys. And I could take a maybe one of those pitchers and let the 20th overall pick or something like that. Or even an outfielder, like like I said earlier, Marte. Or even if Trey Turner falls or whoever it may be. He's just a guy that just falls for me. And I don't know. I feel like 
a decline could come here shortly for him. It's great value at the same time, but yeah, I feel like at that ADP, you're paying for him at his best. And I think whenever you're drafting someone, you know, I want to pay a lower price than what their potential is. And I think that is the maximum amount that Jose Ramirez could produce. If he has a season that's not up to what it was last year, he's definitely not worth that ADP. And I think that's my problem with it. Not that he's a bad player. He's in a good lineup, a good position. But I think you're paying for him at his top value rather than really waiting for, you know, a, a good steal or a good value pick. So... Right behind him, batting fifth, is Fran Mio Reyes, who currently is listed as their DH. You'll see him in the outfield a little bit as well. And I'm a, I'm really excited whenever they do start playing to watch Fran Mio, just because I think in his first few seasons, he's had competition no matter where he's been in that outfield. And I think this is the first time where his role is pretty defined, and he's going to be playing every day, whether it is DH or outfield. So he's currently going pick 130. You know, there's a lot of guys that hit home runs, but there's still not a lot where you can say, oh, man, he's a good candidate to hit 40 home runs. So if you're getting a 40 home run guy with pick 130, you know, you can sign me up all day and twice on game day. So I like Fran Mio a lot, and uh, I'm excited to see him with his big opportunity here. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Fran Mio's never had the opportunity to really shine, but and when he has, he has crushed the ball. His power, you just you can't teach power. He really can't. Um, he's got it. He's got everything. There's everything to love about Fran Mill. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to taking him in if he falls. Some people reach on Fran Mill in a lot of drafts that I'm in where I'm at the point where he's going within the top 100 picks, and I just can't get on board on that just because he hasn't had a starting role ever in his career, and the workload could possibly be too much for him. But if he was going past like the 120 range, where he should fall, I'm all on board with it. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> then batting behind him in the sixth spot is Cesar Hernandez playing second base for him. He's currently going pick 251, but his ownership is pretty consistent, so he is being drafted. Um, you know, we've talked about second base being a shallow position before. Cesar Hernandez had 14 home runs last year, 71 RBIs, 9 steals, um, you know, at the back end of a draft, if you're in a really deep league that plays, you know, I'm in a few leagues where you play a second baseman and then there's a middle infield flex. So maybe if you're in a deep league, he's a middle infield flex kind of guy. Uh, besides that, I'm not really drafting him. If he was ever to move up in the order, I might pick him up off the waiver wire if Mercado got injured and he was in that two hole, but is he's kind of capped because he's not going to score as many runs in that six hole. And you know, I, I guess he, he kind of is what he is. Yeah, I agree. That six hole is just horrible because after Framil Reyes, the lineup starts to drop a little bit. I'm passing on him. I just think second base is already shallow as it is, where if you end up with a guy like Hernandez as your starting second baseman, you're not off to a hot start. <laughs> That's offensive to those who have Cesar Hernandez. <laughs> I'm sorry. Love Raw Dog. <laughs> Number seven is Domingo Santana playing the outfield for him, currently going 245. Pretty low ownership percentage. He is a 30 home run guy. I once again throw him. I've said it several times throughout different pods, but I call it the Jock Peterson category. Just low average guys that hit 30, 35 home runs. Domingo Santana falls in that category. You know, and I've said it before, if you're in a position where you need some power at the end of the draft because for some reason you have nobody else in your lineup that has any power, then yeah, sure, maybe. But I think his upside, once again, is kind of capped with his position in the lineup. And he's had a few seasons under his belt now, and I'm, I tend to believe that guys kind of are what they are. I mean, very rarely do you see, and not that say that it doesn't happen, but very rarely do you see a guy go from being, a, eh, you know, he's a 30 home run guy that hits 230 to all of a sudden he hits 40 home runs with, you know, a 300 average. You know, we saw Jorge Soler kind of make that jump last year, but, you know, I'm not betting on that happening. So, you know, I'll let him sit on the waiver wire, and if it happens, I'll pick him up, but I'm not necessarily going to waste draft capital on it. <clears throat> Yeah, I agree. I'm not going to do that either. Um, Santana's all right, but I'm passing. I don't he's know. They call it. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's just he's the, like he's called it the Jack Peterson category, and 
they're just not appealing to me. And I've said it before, maybe if I need like a home run or two at the end of the week, sure. I mean, but outside of that, he's not making my roster. Yeah, you know, and I mentioned it too. I mean, it's easy to find guys in today's game that hit home runs. I think it's more challenging to find guys with a high average. And that's who I tend to try to grab later in drafts. That's why I said before I love Brian Reynolds. Because he's going not quite in that range, but still really late in drafts. And he's going to hit right around 300. And, I mean, there's just not a lot of guys that hit 300 anymore in the swing and miss era here. Not at all. I agree 100%. Then behind him in the eighth spot is Roberto Perez. He is catching for him. Going pick 236. Mm -hmm. Ownership isn't very high. Um, not really a catcher that I would take. Does have that 20 home run potential, but I really think for catcher this year, it's not challenging to find a guy that's betting 220 with 20 home runs. So I'm going to be trying to grab my catcher a little before then, just because I want a little more upside than this. Perez is known, and when you look at his metrics, he's actually one of the best framing specialists in all of Major League Baseball. So he uh, he's more of a defensive guy, so capped upside. I agree. Defensive, defensively great. Batting mediocre. You know, like you said, twenty home runs, a two twenty average. I don't want to rely on that as my catcher at that rate. I wouldn't even play one. <laughs> Just wow! Is that a new strategy that you're going to coin right now? The no catcher strategy. <laughs> I'll coin it. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! Uh, number nine in that lineup is Delano De Shields. He is going to be in the outfield for him. Um, you know, not really being drafted at all right now, but I'm still going to bring him up just because I don't want to skip over him. You know, <laughs> when he gets consistent at bats, he's a 30 steal potential kind of guy. So if you're really desperate for steals, maybe you grab him, but he doesn't really offer much beyond that. You could argue that in that nine spot, he's almost, I've always called the nine spot in the AL the second leadoff guy. So you, you could argue that he's hitting ahead of guys like Lindor, Mercado, Santana. So he, he should score some runs in that position, but he won't get as many at-bats either, batting ninth. So, uh, once again, not really a guy I'm drafting unless you're super desperate for steals or for some reason your league values steals more than others. Um, I'd keep him on the waiver wire. Me too. He's nothing special, um, at least when he doesn't have at-bats. and It sounds like he's not going to get very many of them, so I'll leave him on the wire as well. So I think we're going to shift over to the rotation then. That is it for their lineup. A few interesting mm -hmm. names in their rotation. So we'll kick it off with Shane Bieber, who I know a lot of people are high on. He is currently going pick 31. Um, I'm going to let you start off with Shane Bieber. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> I did write the article on him earlier in the week about uh... – his AL Cy Young candidate, and I do think, for the record, Shea Bieber has all the talent in the world. He's a guy that can go out there year in, year out, and get 250Ks, 17-plus wins, low ERA. He's a guy that can finish at least with a 3.0, 3.1 ERA with 250Ks. I like everything there is about the kid. As far as fantasy baseball goes, though, 31 ADP, a little steep, but... but you're going to rely on him as your number one pitcher. I would do it, but I may be a, more of a believer than most people are. <laughs> Where's the T-shirt, the believer T-shirt? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll rock it out next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the mail. It's in the mail. Next day shipping. Amazon said it won't be here for another month, though. It's, it's, not, um, it's not essential need. <laughs> oh, Amazon and their essential. You can't tell me what's essential. If I need, right. that t -shirt, I need that t-shirt, I need that t-shirt. Hell yeah. How about yeah, you, Doc? I mean, I, I'm kind of on the other end with Bieber. I mean, he definitely has all of the upside that you mentioned, that 250 strikeout potential. Uh, you know, he's going to pitch right around 200 innings in a full season. Not that he's been – he did last year, but so far he's been pretty consistent in staying healthy and uh, giving being an innings eater with getting you good Ks. You know, one of the things that I worry about when I look at his advanced numbers are he actually gets knocked around a little bit. So he had one of the worst uh, statistics as far as batters making solid contact. So that's one of those things. We'll see if it's a trend that continues. 
once again, I think he's for me at 31, one of those guys you're paying for him at his best. You know, and I always say value, value, value. I just, I don't, I think you're paying for what he can be and what he is, but I don't know if he's ever going to be better than he is currently. So I think in that regard, his upside is kind of capped, which sounds weird to say about a young pitcher like that. But, you know, with guys like Castillo and Giolito, who I know you're not very high on, if they're going, you know, 30 to 40 picks later, I think you're paying for them based on you know their potential more and what they can be so because i think all of those guys in that group even chris paddock going in that range i think they can be just as good as bieber is but you're getting them 30 picks later so i mean i don't dislike bieber's talent in any way i just think that you're paying for him at his best and uh, i kind of question his value so i mean he's on a good team he's going to have chance for a lot of wins a lot of k so i can't argue with that adp but I don't. Th- I think I'd call it fair and not value. I I I'd agree. I agree. That's fair value. All right, batting by or batting pitching behind him in that rotation. A few guys that it got called down um, this spring training, but most likely will be in the rotation when the season does kick off. First is Aaron Savale. He's currently going pick 240. He's a sinker ball pitcher. Uh, Everything advanced points to great upside. So he's a guy later in drafts if you're looking for your pitching, which I tend to grab a few late-round pitchers that I think could uh, win you your league. I think that he falls in that category for me. He's one of my favorite late-round pitchers. So I really like Savale at pick 240. I do, too. I actually picked him up late last year. He picked really good when he got called up. I'm all on board on the Savali train, especially in a rotation where, and we'll, we'll discuss later, uh, the, the rotation is really deep where they don't really need to rely on Savali a lot, so the pressure is off on his hands, and I think he can thrive really well on this on this pitching rotation. Yeah, I agree. Be- uh, behind him is Zach Plasanc going 245. I know a lot of people like Plasanc as a sleeper. You know, I mentioned metrics a few times, so I look a lot at that because I think that can tell you a little bit of a story on the player. So a lot of his metrics weren't promising. He kind of got knocked around. A lot of his pitch movement wasn't ideal. So I know people are high on him. At pick 245, I can't argue if you have faith in the guy and you're taking a flyer on him. Uh, Me personally, I think he's going to be more of a – four or five pitcher in the rotation and in this rotation especially when Carrasco and Clevenger are healthy he really is that kind of back end guy and I think he fits in well in that role I agree behind him uh, and it's Adam Pluko he's more of a streamer not really being drafted Uh, the only reason he's there listed right now is because Clevenger is injured and we'll talk about Clevenger a little bit in a minute but Pluko is more of a streamer, not really being drafted. Uh, listed yeah. fifth in their rotation is Carlos Carrasco. I'm not exactly sure why he's listed fifth, but he is, So, uh, according to Roto Champs. So he is currently going pick 122. When he was healthy, he uh, got hit hard a little bit last year, but his pitches still have great movement. I think at 122, he has some upside in that spot because we've seen what he can do when he's healthy. And realistically, you're getting a top 20 or so pitcher when he is at his best. So at pick 122, he offers a lot of upside. I agree. I'm, I'm a huge Carrasco believer as well. I, I, I like everything about this rotation. And I'm going to backtrack a little bit. If everybody's healthy, this rotation has Bieber, Clevenger, Carrasco. So at the fourth pitching spot for Javale, he has he has nothing but all the pressure off his hands, and he could excel very well. And out of the young pitchers you mentioned with Plesac and Javale and Pluko, my money's on Javale to make that roster, mm-hmm. make the rotation at least. Yeah. But, I mean, but back on topic though with the Carrasco at pick one twenty, that's insane value. I'm taking him all day long at that value. And twice on game day if he's healthy. <clears throat> I think it's real, really, really nice value. Uh, number six, we'll go over Mike Clevenger here, who is currently injured, and he's struggled with injuries over the course of his career. He's currently going pick 56. Uh, he's one of those guys in a shortened season this year specifically. I think it benefits him a ton because we saw him really falling in draft. I loved taking him 
in drafts earlier this offseason. He was going around pick that 120 or 10th round, 11th, 12th range. And I love that. I don't care if he's going to miss a month or two because, you know, when he pitches, he's absolutely elite. And, you know, I can't really argue with him going around pick 56 because whenever we do start this season, he's, he's going to be healthy. He was expected to return in May or June, which – is realistically when we're going to start playing uh, if we do play this season. So I really like him in that value. He offers elite ace upside. He's a guy, I don't think we had an article about him winning the Cy Young, but I think that Mike Clevenger is a guy that can absolutely win a Cy Young, and he has that much talent when he stays healthy. Yeah, I completely agree. There's everything to love about Clevenger, and I was actually waiting to go through the rotation to talk about Clevenger. I mean, he is so raw, talented, too. I mean, he throws super hard, and he just goes out there, and he throws it all out there. He, his stamina is completely unreal. When you think he's about to get pulled out of the fifth inning, out of nowhere, he just he just throws for two more. This The Clevenger is going to really benefit well from this, especially since he was supposed to miss the first month and a half of baseball. And as you said, if we ever get baseball, he should be ready for quote-unquote opening day. So, I'm all on board on taking him a pick whenever he falls, 56. I'll take him. I'll take him there, and that's excellent value, I think, even at 56. Yeah, I've paired him a lot in that range. I've gotten Paddock and Clevenger a lot in that range, and for some reason, I just really like that duo in that spot. Oh, for sure. There's nothing to like about that duo. And then, moving over to their bullpen quickly, uh, Brad Hand is their closer. Currently going pick 97. You know, that's about the range when you can start looking at closers. He will get a ton of opportunities with the Indians, so I can't really argue. I think he's the third or fourth closer off the board right now, so I can't really argue with that. He's in a good situation. The only thing that makes me a little nervous is they have James Karsenek, who they just sent down, but he'll be up at some point. And, I mean, Karsen- I mean his K rate is absolutely insane. I think he averages a little over uh, two strikeouts per inning. So he's a guy that has crazy high potential. He's been a pretty good prospect for him. Uh, showed a little bit in his short time in the majors, but he'll be up at some point. And I expect Hand to lose that grasp, maybe not this season, but maybe next. So uh, that's something to monitor. But overall with Hand, I think for this season, he's one of the top few closers off the board. I probably wouldn't take him at 97, but if he starts to fall into that one 10 120 range i'd be a little more comfortable with it yeah i completely agree and we have that rule of thumb of no taking uh closers before pick 100 at least so i think that still applies here i mean 97 is as close as you're going to get anyway to 100 hey hands consistent though yeah as long as hands shows no signs of struggling i don't know how he can't lose his job but i mean shoot if a, if a person behind him is throwing two strikeouts a game an inning i mean that's fucking crazy <laughs> but, I mean, I'll take hand if he falls, uh, like you said, in the 110, 120 range. But I'm going to take an outfielder in the late 90s for me. Yep, I would agree with that. So I think that's everything. Anything else? I think overall with this pitching rotation, I think it has the potential to be really, really good, which you kind of already alluded yeah. to with Bieber, Savale, Clevenger, Carrasco. Now you could slide in Plasanc into that five spot realistically. Uh, This has the chance to be a really dangerous rotation, definitely the best in the division. And I would argue that you could make a case for it being one of the best rotations in all of baseball. I I would completely agree with you on that. And their heading is very, very dangerous as well. This could be a team that could make a World Series run for sure. Yep. Yeah, I think so as well. So I think that's it for the pitching piece of it. I'll mention a few impact prospects that they have briefly Their system is currently ranked 12th in the majors. They have a few guys that are major league ready as of right now. Nolan Jones, who's a top 50 prospect in baseball. He's a third baseman. Uh, I'm not, I think he's a better real life third baseman than a fantasy guy. Hasn't really been able to hit over 15, 20 home runs right now in the minors. They say he has a lot of raw power, but he just hasn't been able to translate it to games yet. I think his role is kind of undefined at this point. They haven't really uh, said that he has any ability to play any position except third. So, you know, they have Jose Ramirez there as of right now, so he's a little blocked. They could bring him up and maybe try him out at first, but kind of capped right now. 
They also have Bobby Bradley, who's played a little bit in the majors last year. He's more of a first baseman, DH type. So I think that he'll be up pretty early. And he's a guy, actually, I keep an eye on. He's been a 30 home run guy in the minors, shown the ability to hit a ton of home runs. So potentially when Fran Mills in the outfield, you could see Bobby Bradley playing DH. Or realistically, Carlos Santana's at the end of his career, maybe needs some rest. I think Bradley's going to slot in uh, whenever Santana decides to hang up the cleats. But uh, those are a few guys that you can expect to probably see up for him in short order. I agree. Uh, Nolan Jones, I do. I am on the uh, Nolan Jones train. Uh, his power, he hasn't really displayed it yet, but I've seen a couple of his batting practices. It's there. He's horrible at guessing pitches, though. So that's what I've noticed, too. Like, he would, I would watch a couple of my league games on stream. And I would watch him play because I was I'm, I watch him really closely. He would look for the fastball almost nine times out of ten and almost never gets it in his at bats. And that's what I've noticed when you think he's getting a fastball, it's the second pitch to the at bat, and you just see a sweeping curve go to him, and he looks absolutely silly out there. But Jones is a guy that will succeed once he guesses his pitches more often. Yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty common with a lot of young prospects that you see. Their strike zone discipline and their pitch recognition isn't very strong, so he is no different. He definitely has the upside. I think it's one of those things that's kind of tough to learn how to do, especially once you get to the major league level, but, you know, he still has that upside, so he, uh, he'll he get his opportunity at some point. For sure, I completely agree. Anything else you want to say about the Indians? Do you think that they're winning the division this year? Yeah, it's going to be them and the Twins, and it's going to be a hell of a race, but I think the Indians pull it out if we had a full season. And that's an if we had a full season. I would say 85 to 90 wins. This team is everything I, I love about it. I mean, they have great hitting, great pitching, nothing to hate on. Yeah, I'd give the advantage to the Twins in the offensive category just because I think True. the Indians have a good top half of their lineup, but we kind of mentioned it before, it falls off. The Twins really, from one to nine, are really strong. So I, I'd give the advantage of the Twins for their offense, but I think it's closer than maybe some people have it. But when you get to that pitching rotation, it's really not even close. So that's really no. what puts it over the edge for me. I think that pitching wins championships still. So I agree. I think that the uh, Indians take the division this year. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree with that as well. But I think that's all that we have on the Indians today. So thank you, everybody, for listening. It's been another episode of Doc and Dog presented by the Fantasy Holics. If you don't already, make sure you like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at FantasyHolics1. And make sure you check out our new website, www.thefantasyholics.com. And make sure you subscribe on YouTube. So once again, thank you guys for watching, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.